Now, uh, this Sunday is going to be the last time that uh, I'll be preaching to the congregation until March 11th, uh, be my final lesson. And uh, we're going to be turning it on over to uh, Steve and Lisa. I know they're going to do awesome. Amen. And uh, so, you know, I wanted to have a lesson that was going to be challenging this morning. The title of the lesson is God or Money. Now, to begin with, though, we got to test your Bible knowledge. Who was the greatest male financier in the Bible? Noah. He was floating his stock while everyone else was in liquidation. Okay. Who was the greatest female financier in the Bible? No, it's not Noah's wife. It's Pharaoh's daughter. She went down to the bank of the Nile... And drew out a little prophet. <laughs> Amen. Won't it be good to have Steve preaching for you? Amen. You know, a book that I've been uh, studying for the past several months has been the book of Luke. And I found it fascinating because there are, very, there are several threads that are in it. And one of them is the thread of money. And I'd like for us just to quickly overview all the scriptures in the book of Luke that either directly or indirectly relate to money. So you might want to just write down these scriptures. For those that are visiting, we're very serious about studying the Bible right here. And we bring our Bibles, we bring our notebook, and we, we check out what's being said. Because uh, if what's being preached is not in the Bible, then just blow it away, forget it. But if indeed it is indeed what the Word of God says, then it's not some graying, aging preacher that's stepping aside for some young, glorious guy. But it's the Word of God, and we need to obey it. Amen, guys? So, let's get our Bibles out. Let's go to the book of Luke. God or money? In the Song of Mary, we find the first allusion to money in verse 53. It says, God has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. Right here, we'll find this contrast between poverty and riches several times in the book. Luke chapter 2, we find in verse 22, when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And offer a sacrifice in keeping what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Well, of course, every Jewish male was dedicated to the Lord. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 12, you'll find that the actual sacrifice was supposed to be a lamb. Unless the family was so poor that they had to offer either two doves or two pigeons. So the implication right here is that Jesus is from a very poor family. Amen? Chapter 3 of the book of Luke. People are coming out to John the Baptist and they want to be baptized. And we read in verse 10. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered. The man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked. What should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, well, what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Wow. You got to be content with your pay to get baptized. How about it, guys? Are we content with our pay? Amen. Let's move on. Luke chapter 4. Verse 5, of course, is the devil is tempting Jesus. And he says, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. Luke 4, 18, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God has a special heart for the poor. As disciples of Jesus, we need to have a special heart. Amen? Amen? Chapter 5, verse 11. We find the calling of the fishermen. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And Jesus says, so they pulled up their boats on shore, left everything, and they followed 
Jesus. So the Bible says right here, they literally left everything in order to follow the Lord. Their jobs, their occupation, their family in order to follow God. You say, was that just a special scripture just concerning the fishermen? No, no, no. Read on down right here to the calling of Levi. Verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Is that awesome? And challenging. Luke chapter 6. Verse 20 talks about that the poor are blessed of God. And verse 24 talks about the rich have already received their comfort. Here's anyone. uh, Luke 6 beginning in verse 34. He says. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment. What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Wow. How many disciples have been embittered when someone didn't pay them back? That's a challenging scripture. Chapter 7, verse 22, talks about the sign of the Messiah is preaching good news to the poor. In verse 25, it talks about John the Baptist not being a man dressed in fine clothes or, or one that lives in a palace. Then in chapter 7, verses 41 and 42, Jesus tells the story to Simon the Pharisee. He says, two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, another 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And, of course, Simon answers correctly. He says, well, the one that had the greater debt canceled. And Jesus goes on to say, yes, and that's why this woman loves me so much it's because she understands how much she's been forgiven and of course the whole principle wasn't that some of us have less sins to be forgiven of it's that we should all appreciate how much we've been forgiven amen guys oh luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 talks about all the rich women that supported jesus in his ministry now that would look great in the headlines today wouldn't it Also in Luke chapter 8, verse 33, is the casting out of the demon legion from uh, the man legion into 2,000 pigs. Of course, all 2,000 pigs die. And of course, the town has a wicked bad attitude towards Jesus because those pigs were worth money. But you have to ask yourself, how much is a soul worth? In chapter 9, Jesus says in verse 3, take nothing for the journey. In chapter 9, verse 25, Very interesting and challenging scripture. Jesus says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet to lose or forfeit his very self? Then in chapter 10, in verse 35, we we, we find a very interesting scripture that talks about the good Samaritan. Of course, we remember how two men passed by the man that was injured on the side of the road. And yet it was the good Samaritan that stops, not only helps him, but takes him to an inn and pays money to take care of this guy. Of course, that's what it really means to be a neighbor. That's what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to sacrifice your money for others. Amen, guys? In chapter 11, verse 42, challenging scripture right here. He says, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs. But you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you because you're like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. He says, you are dead in your faith, and people don't even know you're Christians. And one of the marks is the fact, oh, you may give your tithe. But bottom line, you're not a person full of love, mercy, and And justice, and that's what Jesus has called us to be. Amen, guys? In chapter 12 and verse 6, Jesus talks about how sparrows are worth only a couple pennies, and yet God looks after them. Are not we of much more value than the sparrows? So in other words, God's really concerned about us. Amen? In chapter 12, verse 13, he talks about dividing the inheritance. And you know how families can get all in a mess when it comes to an inheritance. And Jesus deals with it, and he talks about the greed that's in people's heart. And then he tells the story of building bigger barns. 
and how after the guy had built the bigger barns, he says, now your soul is required of you tonight. Wow. The Lord lays it out, doesn't he? Amen, guys. In chapter 14, we find the parable of the great banquet about the kingdom and how people make excuses because of their job. They say, hey, I just brought this field. I just brought these oxen. And now sometimes people make an excuse, even today, and say, well, I got my job. I can't come to work Wednesday night. Or I can't come to church Wednesday night. Bottom line, guys, hey, where are our priorities? God or money? In chapter 14, he talks about counting the cost. He uses the analogy of money. And in verse 33, he talks about giving up everything. In chapter 15, he talks about the parable of the lost coins. And then, of course, even in chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son, how he squandered his wealth in wild living. Chapter 16 is what we're going to be studying today. And so in chapter 17, we find in verse 30 these words. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus right here. And he says, hey, you've got to have your mind totally focused on the Lord. Nothing is worth turning back from the Lord. Amen, guys? In chapter 18, in verse 9, talks about the parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector. And then, of course, the very famous parable of the rich young ruler right there, where Jesus says, hey, it's great that you tried to keep all my commandments, but one thing you lack, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And, of course, the man's face fell. Challenging, huh? Chapter 19 is Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. Now, this guy's awesome because he understood repentance and in verse 8 it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Now that's repentance. Amen? Then in chapter 19, verses 11 and following, is the parable of the ten minus. And then in chapter 19, verses 45 to 46, he talks about clearing the temple, which Jesus calls the house of prayer, but they made it into a den of robbers. And then chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus deals with the issue of paying taxes to Caesar, and he believes in paying his taxes. And then, very interestingly, in the end of chapter 20 are these words in verse 47, talking about the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He says, they devour widows' houses for a show and make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Wow, he, he's talking about how the religious leaders of that day says they just took in everybody's collection and they lived high and mighty, devouring widows' houses, and they just made a show of their religiosity. But look at this. Remember, the text is not broken up originally. Notice that Jesus goes from there to verse 1 of chapter 21. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, gave all she had to live on. Isn't this interesting? He deals with the sin in the religious leaders. And the money that they used was from the, quote, widows. And yet right here, the widow is still giving to God at the temple. See, a lot of people think, well, I don't really believe in what's going on at the church. And so what they do is they withhold their contribution because they think they're giving to man. And yet the Bible teaches, and this widow fully understood, that she was giving her gift to God. Are you with me right here, guys? Now, prayerfully, in the congregation here, we trust the brothers and sisters. They're dealing with the money. Amen, guys? But I think it's very important that we don't confuse why we give. We give because we're giving to God, and that's what this widow was commended for. In chapter 22, a very famous account, of course, Judas takes money to betray the Lord. In chapter 23, it's money that Jesus was charged of, of taking. And it says, hey, he doesn't pay taxes to Caesar. Of course, we know that he did. But most interestingly, we read about his crucifixion. 
in verse 32 these words. Two other men, both criminals, robbers, also were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified along with him. One on his right and one on his left. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Wow. At the very end of his life, Jesus is crucified by a robber on his right and a robber on his left. Unbelievable. Why did the Lord set that up that way? Because robbery is is one of the ultimate forms of selfishness. And selfishness for your own gain that even the world recognizes wrong. And then, right before him, the soldiers are casting lots for his clothes. I mean, he's showing that, man, Jesus left this world with absolutely nothing. That's how much he cared for this world. You see, we've got a choice this morning. God or money. Let's turn to our text, Luke chapter 16. That's a lot of scriptures on money right there. Amen, guys? Our first point is spend your money wisely. Let's see if the Lord has to say about this. Chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There's a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be a manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of the master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The master told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it out to be 400. Wow, this is a crafty guy, huh? Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it out for 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Kind of an interesting parable right here, isn't it? Jesus uses someone's sin, their dishonesty, to make a point. His point, I believe, is perfectly clear. Is when this guy saw that he was going to be out of a job, he acted dishonestly to win the favor of these other people so they would take him in. Now, Jesus is not calling us to be dishonest guys. Amen, guys? Can I have an amen on that? Amen? But he is making a strong point. He says, man, even the people in the world are more shrewd about using their money than the people of the light, the disciples. He says, people of the world understand they got to use their money to make friends. Now, we're not using our money to make friends for the sake of our own gain. But the Bible says right here, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwelling. In other words, You use your money to help get your friends to heaven. Are you with me right here? You know, the Bible has a lot to say about the use of money. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we find some strong admonitions that I think are very good for us. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, if there's any challenge, I think, for disciples, it's to be content with what you have. And not always be longing for more. For he brought nothing into the world, we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There have been many people that have lost their faith because they are more consumed with getting rich than getting to heaven. And we as disciples need to be aware of that. I mean, isn't it the most amazing thing? You're not thinking about particularly buying anything, and you go to the mall for whatever reason, you go, oh, wow, I really like that. Have you ever felt that? I mean, you feel that piece of furniture calling you inside right there? Or you, you, you see that video, and you've already seen the movie three times at the theater, but you go, oh, I gotta have that. I just gotta have that. I mean, it is amazing how we're attracted to things. Look what he says on in 
chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, Americans are in the top 10% of all the world as far as wealth is concerned. But you know, a lot of times we don't think that we're very rich because we see other people that have more than us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. You know, it's really interesting. A few weeks ago, we had a couple visit the congregation. And it's not unusual for us to have several people visiting just to see what the Lord is doing here. But they'd heard so much. They'd heard a bunch of negative. They'd heard a bunch of positive. And they said, hold it. We got to go see for ourselves. What is this Portland Church of Christ all about? And they came and they, they, they were mesmerized. They were blown away about what the Lord was doing in this place. It's very interesting. Afterwards, he came to me and says, you know, the, the, Lord, has, the Lord has blessed us really, frankly, with, with being fairly rich. And uh, we would like to help you guys out in some ways. Uh, Kip, is there any way that you and the elders would suggest that, that we could help you? And I thought for a moment, yeah, there is a way. <laughs> I said, hey, here's the thing. We've had so many new churches start, from the Congo to over in Europe and Central America, and we've got a lot of uh, brothers and sisters in those places that need everything from uh, microphones to uh, contacts with other people. I said, we, we've indebted ourselves $15,000. And we, we really need that money because we really want to see these churches be perpetuated. And the other thing is that we've got a special missions contribution coming on up in March. Amen, guys? For $150,000. And that's a challenge for our church because we don't really have that, that, that will to do of a church. Well, I said, okay, let's pray and think. They prayed and they fasted, and just a couple of days ago, they gave us a check for $30,000. Is that awesome? See, that's from a person that just visited one time. How about us that are here all the time? Not only are we rich from a worldly point of view, but we're rich in a spiritual point of view. But how are we spending our money? Is it to win souls, or are we really tight with our money? Are we tight? How about, are, are, we, are we hospitable and having people into our homes? Or do you think, oh, no, it costs a lot of money to serve the food, and my rug might get soiled. <laughs> Guys, we are all about getting to heaven and bringing as many people as possible with us. Are you with me here, church? Are you with me here? Well, let's, let's read on in the parable right here. Go back to Luke 16. I have to apologize for my voice today. I've got a bit of a cold, so please bear with me. In verse 10, let's keep on reading. Chapter 16. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you in true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, Oh, he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. You know, what a challenging passage. Jesus flat lays it out. You cannot serve both God and money. You're either going to serve the Lord or you serve yourself. And it's kind of interesting. It's the religious people that get especially ticked off at Jesus. 
I got to ask you a little question. When we talk about money or even addressing these scriptures that we have today, do you feel a little uneasy? A little queasy? Maybe feeling something down here? Or, or do you even kind of tense up and sneer? You see, the, the reason we have that reaction is we haven't totally let go. You know, if I start talking about, hey, let's love each other more. Does that tense you up? Let's have a lot more peace. I, I mean, I mean, I mean when say, uh, let's have a lot more peace. I go, sneering. No, I mean, when, 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 when the rubber meets the road, that's, that's when we start to feel it. Are you with me right here, guys? Thank you so much. You know, I've, I've, I've got to boast in the Lord about one of our brothers. It's Greg Goman. And I respect him as my elder because he turned 53 yesterday. Amen. For those who don't know, I'm 52, so he's, he's, he's gone on ahead of me there. He's an upward call. And uh, he and Carol have been incredible examples of faith for us in the congregation right here. About loving God more than money. You know, Greg, uh, and I asked him last night in a phone call if I could share this, and, and he said, hey, bro, we're super open to family. Everybody knows everything, and, and that's the way it needs to be in a Christian family. Amen, church? But uh, Greg has lupus, and, uh, you know, many people have lupus, mostly females, but when a male has lupus, it's very, very bad, and the doctors believe that he's only got about three more years to live. And that's very sobering. And so when he started to hear about what was happening in Portland and had, and had a chance to come down and, and uh, see what we're all about in Chicago, he says, listen, I've got my wife and my daughter, Katie, and my son, Zach. The kids are teens. And I'm not going to be here. I've got to make sure I've got to take care of them spiritually. And so this past August, they literally left everything. Uh, they put up their retirement. Carol gave up her tenure as a teacher. And he gave up his home business to be able to move from Milwaukee to Portland to make sure his family gets to heaven. Well, not only have they come, and the Lord has blessed them. Both Katie and Zach have been baptized in the last four months. Is that awesome? But the Holy Spirit's used Greg and Carol powerfully because along with Guy Hobbs and Allison, they formed the Lazarus Ministry. And this has met the needs of so many people that, that have physical ailments like, like Greg or depression issues like Allison. And, and these people are being called to be able to be sold out disciples. And yet they have a group that really understands the pain that they're going through and how tough it is. And I don't know about you, that quiet time series is flat awesome. Are you fired up about what the Lazarus ministry did right there? Amen, church? Now, now we, we've, got to, we've got to really sort through this a little bit. Why, why does that inspire us? Because we know down in our hearts there is no price that we can't pay to get us and our family to heaven. Are you with me right here? Let's talk about the special contribution. Certainly we need to be faithful in our giving weekly. Amen, church? But have we begun to set aside for the special contribution? The special contribution on average is about 12 times what we're presently giving. And Elena and myself, we're giving more than that, of course. And I know most of the other leaders have pledged the same thing. But we really need this money to be able to send off the Los Angeles mission team. And you know, it's great. Elena and myself and the Board of Areas were down there just this past week. I mean, when you see the vast millions of people that are not having the chance to know Jesus Christ, I mean, your heart just goes out to them. And even today, I mean, sending out the boys here 
in Alan and Jonathan going down to Australia. That's flat awesome. Amen, guys? To be able to know that Daniel is going down to Las Vegas and preach the word down there. That's what's all about to be disciples. But we, we've got to ask ourselves, do we really have a mindset? Man, we've really got to go after this, getting this special contribution, doing whatever it takes in order to be sacrificial to get more souls to heaven. You know, I remember many years ago in the Boston church, uh, they'd made a big to-do in some of the churches of Christ about the fact that uh, people were having million-dollar contributions in order to have a, a church building. And certainly in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with a church building, but we, of course, know the scriptures talk about, hey, it's one thing to have a church building, but we've got to be ministering to the lost. Amen, guys? But some guy wrote, he says, where is the church that's going to rise up, and instead of giving a million dollars for a church building, they give a million dollars for missions. And we in the Boston church, we put that out there as kind of a, a personal challenge. Yeah, let's be the first church to do that, to give a million dollars for missions. And it was incredible. I mean, people, people stepped up. Some of the brothers sold a coin collection. Now, some of you guys go, that's not much. For them, it was. Trust me, I know. One of the sisters, she sold her a prize horse. One of the families sold their home for the special. Elena put in the diamond from her wedding ring and even to this day has a zirconium replacement. That's the kind of sacrifice that we believed in, and we got a million dollars on that day. And we were able to send churches out to Bombay, to Stockholm, to Paris, and to Mexico City. God blessed us. Now, Portland Church, it's our turn to step out. Those of you guys that are disciples, you're here because others sacrificed in order to get the word preached. They sacrificed, yes, their energies, but they also sacrificed financially to be able to plant new churches. And as a congregation, that is what we are committed to do, is to preach the word around the world by planting new churches. Are you with me right here? And so, guys, our second challenge is serve your God wisely. Make the decision. God or money. Let's go to our last point. Still in chapter 16, but now we're going to the passage beginning in verse 19. Now, some people think this is an actual account. Others believe it's a parable. I believe it's a parable, but we read in verse 19 these words. There's a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now that's a visual, isn't it? The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. So those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn him so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, the scriptures. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And, of course, Jesus was talking about himself right there. Amen, guys? You see, faith is not an intellectual issue. It's a moral issue. People don't want to change their lives. Right here we find a very challenging account of the rich man and Lazarus. And the Bible says right here that they both died. Here's the bottom line. Whether you're rich or poor, we're all going to die. The last time I looked, the mortality rate of Portland was 100%. We're all going to go. 
It's a fact. But a lot of people don't live their life believing that. They just, they just push it out of their mind. Everybody is going to die. And the Bible says that when these two died, one, Lazarus, went to heaven to be at the Lord and by Abraham's side, and the other one went to hell. There was no in-between. There was no purgatory. That's a false doctrine. You either go to heaven or you go to hell, and there's a great chasm that's been fixed, and you can't go back and forth. And hell is described as being so bad right here. As the rich man yelling on up there and say, hey, please, just have Lazarus dip his finger in some water so you can just put a drop of water on my tongue. And, of course, the great chasm prevented that. But very interesting to me, above all else, is verse 27. He says, well, then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. You know, it's amazing to me. This rich guy didn't get evangelistic until he went to hell. What is it going to take for us to start preaching the word? Can you imagine, and the purpose of this passage is to do that, is for us to be in hell. Well, let's not imagine that. In heaven. And we look down on earth and we see our friends and our family that are unsaved, that are not in a right relationship with God, and we haven't said anything to them. You know, we have a lot of people in the church here who have a peace, peace mentality when it comes to their family. They don't want to make people upset. But sometimes people got to get upset in order to get your attention so they really think about God. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, in two weeks, we have our Bring Your Neighbor Day. And we need to have a cranking Bring Your Neighbor Day. And Steve Johnson's going to be preaching, and we know Steve is going to do an awesome job. But it's going to make a difference on whether you go out and you share your faith, you invite your friends. But you just don't casually invite and go, hey, you got to come to this church where God is really moving. God is really changing people's lives. Well, I don't know. No, you really got to come. And sometimes you got to ask once or twice or 50 times. But sometimes at the 50th time, they finally come to church. Right, yo? <laughs> See? You, you got to beg. It's so important. This is people's personal relationship with God. We got to have a fire in our bellies if we're going to save people. Are you with me right here? You know, um, this past week, as, 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 I, as I shared, we went down with the Board of and Elena down to Los Angeles. And uh, Nick was looking at perhaps future job possibilities. And we went to this one fellow that... Uh, it kind of works as a subsidiary for Nike. I don't fully understand it, but uh, it's a Korean fella. And we went in, and we had a little talk, and uh, Nick said, hey, you got to come on up. The guy wants to hear more about the church. I go, well, amen. Well, it was really kind of blow away is this guy begins to share about his denominational church. And then I realized they don't practice a lot of the right doctrine. But you got to commend that's which is good. In other people's lives. Amen, guys? And this guy talked. He says, yeah. He says, you know, uh, I'm not going to be here for a few months. And Nick and I asked, well, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to Kansas. And he says, the, the, the head church of my fellowship is in Kansas. And they have this uh, place they call the IHOP. Hang on, the IHOP. Not the pancake spot, is it? No, it's the International House of Prayer. I go, that's a cranking title. I hop. I like that. <laughs> and he says, he says, this guy just started. And what, what they do is they, they literally have these non-full-time people take off a month or two months or three months or six months just to come 
and worship and praise God without having the burden of the job. He said, I just went there for a week. He says, I didn't think I'd like it very much. I'm going back for more. And then it was really, you know, it, it was, that was kind of challenging. I mean, when you, when you see these kind of people who don't have the right doctrine being so zealous for God, that's, that's convicting. That's challenging. You know, it's, it's great because Nick was able to share that he and his wife are seriously thinking about taking three to six months off to be on the L.A. mission team, not have a job, but train in the ministry. And it was awesome because, you know, that's the kind of radical faith it's going to take. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 14, verses 1 and following, that Paul and Barnabas spoke so effectively that they won a great number of souls. You see, yeah, we need to preach the word, but we got to be disciple. We got to learn how to be effective. And the more chance you around other disciples who know how to do it, the more you're going to be effective. Are you with me right here? You see, I, I got I to ask you a question. I mean, how radical are you? You look at this Korean fellow down in LA, you go, man, that guy's out there. You go, wow, that's an upward call. Do you look at a Nick Bordier and you go, man, I can't believe it. He's thinking about leaving Nike and he's up, upper management. He's cranking the money. Or you go, wow, that's a disciple who loves his God and not money. You know, I really believe that here it is, the new year, and we had an awesome workshop last week. Amen, guys? But we get to ask ourselves, how many decisions are we following through spiritually? Are we preaching the word? Are we getting out there? Are we making the sacrifices to make ourselves effective in winning souls? You know, as I shared before, this is Martin Luther King weekend. What a great American. I, I, uh, I'll never forget. I was traveling in the car for a football game, and an announcement came on over that he'd been assassinated. I mean, back then, I mean, it was just, just blow the hit. And the, the total loss of idealism and the, the, the death of the Candy Brothers and Martin Luther King, I mean, it was a dark time. And idealism began to wane. And I, you've seen the profound effect in this country, the loss of idealism, how it's gone into cynicism and then to materialism. But even, you know, as I think back into our congregations around the world, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of darkness over the last five years. There's been a lot of loss of idealism. And yet, I am so proud of what the Holy Spirit is doing here in Portland and in a few other spots. And, you know, the Lord has blessed us. I mean, incredible things have happened the last three years. And yet, you know, there could be inside of some of us that have been around a feeling of, oh, well, we've, we've really done some, some great things. It's time to, you know, kind of cool out just a little bit instead of heating it on up. Well, Martin Luther King, in one of his famous statements after the Montgomery March, the Montgomery March was very historic in the civil rights movement. It was a high water mark right there. And Martin Luther King lays it out to those that had a similar attitude. He said, some people are saying we need to slow down and cool off. Well, I say we done cooled off too long. You know, you can cool off so much sometimes that you can end up in a deep freeze. You know, brothers and sisters, you're either hot or you're cold. And it's time for us as a congregation to rise up here in 2007 and get hot. Are you with me right here? We need to get on fire. We need to preach the word. We need to get the mission's contribution. And we need to see this world won. Thank you and God bless you.